want to be clear about a few things. Number one, this is not ammunition to attack people who are in leadership for you to say, well, they're a bad leader because, all right? This is an introspective or a look inside yourself type of a sermon series. Now, I already know some people are going to say, why are you preaching this in the church? Why is this not like a leadership seminar or something like that? Well, here's why. J. Oswald Sanders wrote a book called Spiritual Leadership. And in that book, he makes a quote that's not going to be on the screen, but it'll bring the understanding of why I'm preaching this to the entire church body instead of doing some sort of a leadership seminar. J. Oswald Sanders, this is a direct quote, says this, Not every Christian is called to major leadership in the church, but every Christian is a leader, for we all influence others. So I want to say that again because I want it to register in your hearts. Whether you think you are or not, you are a leader in some capacity. He says, not every Christian is called to major leadership in the church, but every Christian is a leader, for we all influence others. You are a leader. Whether you want to be or not, you are a leader. People watch the way you live. The moment that you call yourself a Christian, people are watching you. They're paying attention to the way you live. They're watching the way you carry yourself in every season and situation of life. And throughout this series, we're going to look at different... We won't cover every single one, but we're going to look at different leaders in the Bible. And today, we're going to look at a man named Diotrephes. And you find him in the book of 3 John. It's a very short book. We're not, going to read, we're not even going to read the whole thing. But I'm going to ask you if you would stand with me. We're going to read in 3 John, verses 5 through 10. Then we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into this thing. John speaking here, he says, Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You would do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they've gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that, may, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Focusing on these verses here. I have written something to the church. But Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. And also stops those who want, who want to and puts them out of the church. Let's take a minute to pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises of your word. And I pray that you'd help me to speak your word with clarity. To say nothing less and nothing else. Let every heart and ear be open to the word of God this morning, and may the seed of your word that's planted into our hearts produce godly fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There are two points that I have this morning. The first one is going to have a couple of sub points underneath it, but my first one is this. Bad leaders are selfish. Bad leaders are selfish people. I'm going to give you a quick list of Diotrephes and and just a couple of verses what John had to say about him. He says, Diotrephes puts himself first. He did not respect apostolic authority. He spoke wickedly against the brethren. He did not welcome the brothers. In other words, he was not hospitable. He stopped others who wanted to welcome them. And he excommunicated the people who welcomed the brothers anyway. So when Diotrephes said, don't welcome those people, and the people of the church welcomed them anyway, Diotrephes says, you're kicked out of the church. How many of you want to sit under a pastor like that? You're showing hospitality, and the thanks you get for is you get kicked out of the church. There's a key thread that runs through all of this, and it's the first issue. Diotrephes like to be first. And I find that to be a rampant issue in the church today. We come to church, we go through everyday life thinking first and foremost of ourselves. How can I make my life better? How can I make people do what I want them to do, to think what I want them to think, and to follow my lead? I realize it's, it's good for us to have goals. It's good, it's good for us to take care of ourselves. Right? We can't just let ourselves waste away to nothing and never have any ambition. But it's not good when those things are all we care about. When you wake up in the morning and all you think about is you, 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 you. Friends, that's problematic. There's nothing wrong to think about yourself a little bit. 
say, okay, I need to do this, I need to do that, I, need, I get that. But when we never put any emphasis on other people, when we never have any thoughts about how we can be used of God to be a blessing to someone else, that's a problem. Diotrephes did not like to put anything that, he didn't like to do anything that put others before him. His heart screamed, just from these couple of verses we read, I'm in charge, respect me, and do only as I say. How many of you want to sit under that kind of leadership? Now, the question is, none of us do. So let me ask you another question. How many of you might be that type of leader in whatever spheres of influence you have? In your home, in your family relationships, at your job. Maybe there is some form of ministry that you're involved in. How many of us take up that kind of an attitude? You know what I've found out about being a dad? And I'm far from a perfect one. I'm glad right now I can only see my, my oldest son in here at the moment. What I found out about being a dad is when I serve my kids, they listen to what I say most of the time. It's easier for me to get my kids to do what I'm telling them to do when I do it with love instead of with an iron fist. Now, look, discipline's true. I have to discipline my kids. Scripture tells us, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? We we don't want spoiled kids. That's a big problem with the world we live in today. We've got a bunch of spoiled brats running around. Yeah, those, those adults were kids who weren't disciplined. You're right. We're, we're reaping what we've sown over the last few decades. But I want us to understand something that even discipline has to be done with a heart of love. Regardless of what form of discipline it is, discipline has to be done with a heart of love. And it all comes back to that. It's serving and loving. What do people in your house say about your leadership? What do those people that you influence say about your leadership? I'm going to give you three things about real leaders, godly leaders. I'm going to start with the first one right now. Real leaders know that being first means they put others first. To really be first means you're not first. I know that seems like an oxymoron, but two passages of Scripture. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says this. It says, do nothing. Look at your neighbor and say, nothing. Nothing. From selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant, more valuable, more important than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests. So yeah, it's okay to look to your interests. you got to take care of your stuff. But also to the interests of others. Jesus in Mark 9, 35 says this. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Let me give you a picture of what this is supposed to look like. Being a godly godly leader means that we don't step on others to reach our goals. If If you are a godly leader, you do not step on other people to try to get where you're going. Being a godly leader means that you allow others to stand on your shoulders... If you're a real godly leader, your desire is that those who are under your sphere of influence will go further, be stronger, and have more capability and and, 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 and opportunity than you ever would in your own lifetime. As a dad in my own family, I want my children to have better opportunities. I want my children to have a greater anointing. I want my children to be used more powerfully of God than I ever could. And you know what I find in the church? It's a problem. It's because we get so inwardly focused. I've seen this time and time and time again. We get so inwardly focused on ourselves that we leave our children, our spouses, and everybody around us to just waste away. Not realizing that our leadership in their lives is valuable and important. Did you know that dad, mom, your only job is not to make food and to bring money home so you can provide physical sustenance for your family? Your primary focus is to make sure you do everything in your power to set your family up to know Jesus, to walk in fellowship with him. When I stand before God one day, I will have to answer for how I pastored the church. I will have to answer for how I live my life as a man. But I'm also going to have to answer for the way that I led my family. And I want to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, you know I did my best. I surely was not perfect. 
But I did everything that I could to make sure that my wife and my three children have a residence in heaven right there with me. But in order for me to do that, I have to be willing to serve them. It means I put them first. How many of us are, don't answer this, think about it. How many of us are willing to do that? How many of us are willing to put others first, to see them go further? What about that dream in your life? You want to be famous, you want to be well-known, you want to be this. What if it never happened for you, but it happened for one of your kids? What if it never happened for you, but it happened to someone that you're mentoring? Are we so selfish to not understand that it's not about who gets the stage, it's about who gets the glory? If people are seeing me, there's a problem in that anyway. Now, it's okay for people to recognize God's gifts in your life. You don't have to. Something that drives me crazy, right? I understand there's good things behind it, but I, let's stop acting more spiritual than we really are. Something that drives me crazy, and I used to do it so I can talk about it. People would come up to me and say, Pastor, that was such a good message. I'd say, oh, it was only God. Give God all the glory. You know, give God all the glory. And you know what? There's truth in that. Give God all the glory. Stop trying to act super spiritual. When somebody says something nice, it's okay to just say, thank you. It's okay to say, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. It's very kind of you to say. It's okay to recognize gifts. It's okay to recognize when God's using someone. And it's okay for, for you to say thank you when somebody tells you, good job. There is something in Scripture in multiple places about we encourage one another. That's encouragement. Somebody says, good job. You don't have to be like, ooh. You say, thank you. But in recognizing those gifts, that's not why we use them. You hearing me? We don't use the gifts that God has given to us so that people will recognize us. Again, I'll say it. It's not about who has the stage. It's about who gets the glory. Second thing. Real leaders set the tone through their example, not their demands. 1 Peter 5, 1-4 says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight. So yes, there is oversight, there's leadership. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain. So don't lead in a way that just gets gain for yourself, but you lead eagerly. Look at this in verse 3. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, Jesus, appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. There are too many people who are in the pulpit today that live out the old saying, do as I say, not as I do. I realize no one is perfect, and that group includes me. I am not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination. But godly leadership is not about having the ability to order other people around. Godly leadership is about setting the example for them to follow. I'm just going to be honest with you. This might offend some people, and if it does... I'm not apologizing for what I'm saying. I'm apologizing that your feelings are hurt. I can watch the life of someone that I sit under. This is going to make some people mad. I already know it. You can watch the life of a person who's in leadership. And if their life does not reflect their message, it's okay to leave that leadership. If they are not living what they're preaching, you don't have to stay under that. Matter of fact, if you stay under it, you are an accessory to it. You approve of it, whether you realize it or not. When you sit under leadership that preaches one message and lives another, and you don't say anything to them, I'm not saying you stand up and make a big scene of it, but you approach that person and say, hey, this is what I see and this is what you preach. What is it? And if they refuse to change, it's okay to pull yourself away from that. We need to understand that, listen, godly leadership is not about ordering other people around. It's setting the example for them to follow. Paul did not say, follow Christ because I said so. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, Paul said, watch my example. You want to know how to follow Jesus? Look at how I live. Was Paul perfect? No. No. Am I going to be perfect? No. Are you going to be perfect? No. None of us are going to be perfect. 
But Paul was able to say, even in my imperfection, my heart is to fully pursue Jesus with everything that I have. And I know I'm going to trip up along the way, but I'm telling you, follow my example. If you don't know what it means to follow Jesus, look at the way I live. And you're going to mess up just the same as I'm going to mess up. They might not look the same as far as how we mess up, but we will. But Paul said, follow my heart. Understand that I am pursuing Jesus. And you can watch my example of pursuing Jesus and do the same. But what Paul did not say was, follow Jesus, even though I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to give you the message, and I'm not going to live out what I'm doing or what I'm preaching. In other words, I'm not going to practice what I preach. Last thing about real leaders, real leaders love what is good more than they love themselves. Titus 1, 7 and 9 says, For an overseer is God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Then the flip side of that is, it needs to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may, able, he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Real leaders love what is good more than they love themselves. You know what I find in verse 7? If we could put that back on the screen, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. In this list that Paul's given to Titus, he says, here's the things that a, a, an overseer should not be. All these things are selfish. It builds into what we're talking about. Somebody who's arrogant is selfish. They think they're, you know, their stuff don't stink. You know what I mean? They're quick-tempered. They're quick-tempered because they didn't get their way, and they have no patience to deal with things when things don't go their way. They're drunkard. They have no self-control. They just do what they want to do, imbibe, and bling, bling, bling. it doesn't matter. This is what I want, so this is what I'm going to do. They're violent, again, no self-control. They're greedy for gain. They don't care how it affects other people. They just want more for themselves. Are we getting a common thread here? They're selfish. And then Paul flips the narrative in the next verse. He says, but here's how they should be. They need to be hospitable. Open their homes and their hearts to the people that they serve. Because that's the thing. Leadership is service. When you lead, you serve. Jesus set the primary example. It's servant leadership. If you show me someone who is leading, but they're not serving, I'll show you one who's not leading at all. And when you look at all these things, he says, they need to be open, have open hearts and an open home to the people that they serve. Hospitable. To be a lover of good. Someone who is less concerned about their own selfish things. Remember, because Paul's giving us a compare and contrast. Verse 7, he gives us all the stuff that a leader should not be. An overseer should not be. And then he flips it and says, okay, don't be this, but in verse 8, be this instead. So the opposite, he says, they should love good. They shouldn't love themselves. They should love what is good. Now, of course, I want to step aside for a second. Yes, you should love yourself. I'm not saying you should have any sort of like self-deprecation where you hate yourself or you beat yourself up. That's not of God either. The point I'm trying to make is, is you love God's good more than you love yourself in the sense of I want what I want you're willing to lay down yourself your life your desires for the cause and the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ it says love what's good be self-controlled be upright be holy and be disciplined godly leaders will stand for the truth and they'll walk that truth out godly leaders will bring correction when it's needed but it all again flows from that place of loving God seeking his good in all things and seeking to serve the people that we lead. Diotrephes in our main passage, he gives us a bunch of examples of what can go wrong in leadership. I gave you several things here, but there's one more I want to separate and hone in on just for a little bit here. And it's this. The second point is bad leaders are unteachable. Bad leaders are selfish and bad leaders are unteachable. John says this in verse 9. He says, I've written something to the church. So John, at, at, at an earlier point, because of what we're reading here, at an earlier point, at some, some spot there, John wrote a different letter to the church. But what did Diotrephes do with it? 
It says, Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, first, does not acknowledge our authority. John had written a different letter, an earlier letter, but Diotrephes decided, you know what? We don't need to hear what John has to say. We'll just throw this to the side. In other words, he figured he didn't need John's help because he already knew what he was doing. I don't need John to tell me what to do. I don't need John to give me instruction. I got this under control. I know what I'm doing. John, keep your nose out of it. There's something that we have lost in the church that we need to understand, especially as it pertains to leadership. The best leaders are the best students. What? The best leaders are always the best students. What do you mean by that, Aaron? I mean this. What does the word disciple mean? If you look it up in its original language, first off, when we think of the term disciple, we think Christian, right? I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the definition of the word disciple means to be a student or a learner. So by definition, to call yourself a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ means you are a student in his classroom. The best leaders in the church are always the best students. Romans 12, 16 says this. Live in harmony with one another. For, I'll give you a homework assignment. Read, read Romans 12. Beautiful chapter in scripture. But we're in a spot where Paul's just like peppering a lot of like little nuggets. It's almost like reading Proverbs a little bit. Where he's just like this and this and this. But look what he says. He says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or prideful, but associate with the lowly. And then he says this. Never be wise in your own sight. In other words, let me put it in my translation. The moment that you think you have it all figured out, you better look out. The moment you think you have all the answers, (laughs) honey, let me tell you, someone, someone or something is going to remind you that you don't. The people who are prideful are the hardest to teach. I've seen it in ministry. I've seen it in school classrooms. The people who are full of themselves have no room to take in new information that they need. When you're full of yourself, there's no capacity that you have to gain anything that you actually need. It's one of the most dangerous things about pride is because you're so full of yourself, God can't put anything in you. We must ask ourselves, as individuals, how prideful am I? Am I teachable? Can I be corrected when I am confronted with a wrong? Or do I immediately defend myself? This is a hard one, okay? But I'm going to tell you something here. This this was probably new information for some, likely not for most. But I'm going to give you a practical way to deal with how, how you handle yourself when someone confronts you with a wrong, even if they do it with the worst attitude possible. You ready for this? Look, I've had people come to me with the most sincere heart and say, Pastor, I saw this. I don't know if I agree with it. I'm like, okay. I've had people come in, Pastor, you're an idiot. I can't believe you did that. Well, I didn't appreciate that tone of voice, but... But in any situation, when someone comes to you and they say, this is what I see that's wrong, my first reaction should not be to defend myself. It should be to listen. Now, does that mean that every time you're confronted with a wrong, you're actually wrong? No. But what if you are? And instead of taking the moment to be teachable, you put up your duke, so to speak, in defiance. And you say, I'm not going to listen to this. Maybe God is using that person to teach you something. But because of your stinky attitude and because of your pride, you're going to have to take this lesson again at a different point because you're not willing to take it right now. You know something I'm, I'm, I'm learning more and more in my life as I get older? I like to pass the test the first time. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you have had those retakes before where you're like, geez, I hate this class. You know, I don't want to take this test again. But you know, (laughs) as I said, for over 30 years. Well, we all have different journeys, don't we? But but I, I like to pass the test the first time. We all face various tests in life. We do. We don't like them, but we face them. And I have just learned and continue to learn, don't have it mastered, But I am continuing to learn the importance of 
even when people confront me with the most negative and hateful attitude possible, Lord, are you speaking to me in this situation? The delivery is terrible. This person's heart is terrible. That, that all may be true. But even with that, is God trying to teach me something in the middle of it? And you know what I've found? Sometimes he is. The messenger doesn't look the way I want. Sure, surely he's not talking to me the way I like. But hear me. The message is still from the Lord. Are we willing to lay our pride aside and say, you know what? Maybe there's something for me to learn here. No one is right 100% of the time. No one. And because of that, we all have to remain teachable and humble. I'm going to read a few passages from Proverbs. And we're going to describe how Scripture describes someone who is unteachable. Proverbs 13, 18 says, Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction. But whoever heeds reproof or correction, whoever listens to instruction and who listens to correction is what that means, is honored. Proverbs 12, verse 1, and then I'll immediately go to verse 15 in the same chapter. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof or correction is stupid. That's in the Bible. That's not me adding words. That's the scriptural word. The person who hates correction is stupid. Verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. So according to the word of God, not Pastor Aaron, not somebody, no. According to the scriptures, here's what we learn about people who are unteachable. If you are unteachable, your reward will be poverty and disgrace. If you are unteachable, the scripture says you're stupid. If you're unteachable, you're a fool. If you're unteachable, you're hopeless. I don't know about you, but I don't like any of those descriptions being attached to my name. So you know what that tells me? I'm still in class. I'm still a student. I still have a lot to learn. I want to encourage you this morning. There is encouragement in this. Scripture gives us examples of bad things so we don't have to follow those models. And we're going to find all kinds of different lessons as we go throughout this series. I just I want us to grab a hold of for this for this day. I want you to grab a hold of this. You can grow. If you're dealing with selfishness right now and I got news for you, we all are. Do you want fries with that? That's the first thing that came to my mind when I did that. A little levity is okay sometimes. But I just want you, to, I want you to listen to this. You don't have to stay in that place. Now, we're all going to deal with selfish things throughout the course of our lives because that's the battle of the flesh versus the spirit. If you've been unteachable and you thought, Oh, I know it all about this particular topic. I, I just have good news for you. There's still more to learn. So open your ears, open your heart, open your mind to the things and the word and the people of God. I want to remind you of this. None of us are complete experts in any field. We may know a lot, but we don't know it all.